Welcome back, viewers. Jumping back into the fray here with John Lane in Australia. John, how are you? Yeah, well, thanks, Louis. Yep, still good. Same here. Hanging in there in spite of all the stuff going on in society. <laughs> we're, we're clinging yeah, to sanity yeah. over here as best we can. You, you always look good to me. I, I, I don't even think to ask. You, you look great. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's an illusion, man. But uh, all right, so what we're going to do today, we're going to continue on with some of our viewer questions. And uh, one of them that just keeps popping up is this question about where the church is. And there's a gospel passage where our Lord suggests that there's going to come a time toward the end where the church will be eclipsed. And I'd like to get your thoughts on that notion and see if we can go a little bit more deeply into this question. Where is the church and what does this mean to say that the church will become eclipsed? Yes, that's Our Lady of La Salette. But uh, yeah, that, that, it, it, those who've been following this series will remember that one of the things I've said several times, uh, and, and I'm not saying anybody else has to think this, but I, I find it incredibly useful, is in the spirit of faith just to remember that this is going to be over. You know, whoever the church is going to look in the future, it's, it, she's not going to look like this forever. Um, this is a period. This is a temporary period. And then at some point, there'll be a resurrection of the church. Now, whether that is very minor and the end of the world comes or uh, or whether it's major and there's, and there's you know, the period of uh, peace that's, that's mentioned by Our Lady or promised by Our Lady, really, uh, at Fatima... Um, this period will be over. So, so what we must be aware of is that when we're thinking about these things, when we're trying to wrestle our way through them, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know, the human mind is made for truth, and and we do need to have some sort of operating theory to to enable us to make sense of of the state of the church now. But in doing so, don't let it threaten your faith. You know, the church is the church. The church is always persisting, and she's still in the world, and she has all her essential attributes. Um, so I've got a passage from a book which I think will interest you it's a, it's a book called The Divine Plan of the Church it was written as an apologetics book really uh, directed at Anglicans I'd say written by um, uh, a Reverend John McLaughlin published in 1901 uh, it's, it's got an imprimatur from Cardinal Vaughan Archbishop, Archbishop of Westminster at the time so on page 93 of this book um, I'll just read you a little bit of this. I think I think you'll find it interesting. He's talking about the church herself, for and and he's and he's referring when he says he, he's obviously referring to our Lord. So he says, for he, our Lord, framed her in such fashion that he was bound to see that whatever amount of wickedness was to be found among her members, or whoever was to be to be her visible head for the time, whether saint or sinner, she should never, in her character of universal teacher. Teach error, either in faith or morals, practice a false worship, pass a law involving immorality, or do anything which would force him to forsake her. We concede, moreover, that there may have been occasions in the past, and such intervals may occur in the future, when, through the opposition of anti-popes and a variety of untoward circumstances, mm -hmm. it was difficult for individuals, for the moment, to tell where the right source of authoritative teaching was to be found this however does not change the state of the case in the least the one true church was in the world somewhere all the time and in full possession of all her essential prerogatives although for the passing hour from transient causes she may not have been easily discernible to the less observant just as there have been times when some dense fog or mist made it impossible for the ordinary observer to tell the exact spot the sun occupied in the sky, although everybody knew that he was there somewhere. Know too that he would in due course, sorry, knew too that he would in due course make the exact location of his presence visible to all, and that as soon as the mist lifted, his rays would come straight to the earth again, and everyone would see that he was identically the same luminous orb that had shone before. So, you know... He's using the sun as a metaphor for the church. Uh, the sun can be eclipsed, uh, it can be obscured by a mist, um, and uh, that that 
obscuring can be of varying degree. So you can have the, the less observant and the more observant. And he says, you know, the less observant may not be able to see it at all. And, and the more observant, you know, perhaps somebody more trained or, you know, with a, with a keener eye can just make out the faint outline through the mist. Um, but in any case, when the mist clears, everybody's agreed it's the same sun. It was obscured. That is how people will see this period. They, they won't be saying, oh, is it the same church? Was there an essential break? Well, <laughs> perhaps the more timorous and, and, and faithless will, but, but Catholics will just know that the church is the church and that somehow she continued through. And this is exactly how people see, the, the theologians and the historians see the Great Western Schism. Uh, you know, there was an apparent breach of unity. It wasn't an essential breach of unity. Therefore, the church's unity persisted throughout. End of story. Right. Anyway, that, that's a great passage, eh? It is indeed, and it goes to something that you've mentioned before, the idea that we do well to place ourselves outside of the current circumstances, kind of look back and have that broader perspective. You know, when we're talking yeah. about uh, something like the church that's been promised to us to exist until the end of time, it's especially useful to do that. And I think what you just said is uh, brings a lot of clarity to it. John, one thing you mentioned, however, you talked about this idea of not being able to teach error. You know, the church can't mm -hmm. do that. And, and it calls to mind an objection that I hear frequently from neoconservative types. They, they like to draw a distinction between what's an actual teaching and what's not. For, for, exa for example, I always come back to this Amoris Laetitia text because it's so blatantly erroneous. <clears throat> Clearly, this person, Francis, who claims to be Pope, is attempting to teach in this document. And yet you have people like Cardinal Burke who will insist it's not magisterium. It's not actually teaching. Therefore, you can't say it's, a, it's an erroneous act that couldn't have come from the Pope or the Church. What constitutes a teaching versus, I don't know, just a document full of words? Is, 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 that, is that Burke's position? Is, is he, uh, I, I, I haven't. Obviously, I don't pay a lot of attention to him, but uh, so I'm not aware of what he said. But is, is he distinguishing between what is the magisterium and right. what is, uh, you know, it, uh, what's the technical term, obit dicta, you know, just just commentary, or is he distinguishing between what he would call the authentic magisterium, so it's official teaching, but distinguishing that from the from the infallible magisterium, is that the distinction? The latter. So could you comment on that? Okay. Is there some distinction to be made such that at the end of that analysis, we can conclude that a text like Amoris Laetitia, it's not any kind of magisterium. It's not teaching. Therefore, it can't be held to be an example of error on the part of the man claiming to be Pope. Because it wasn't teaching at all. It was more or less like a, an op-ed to the New York Times, in other words. And this is the well, Burke Schneider position, I believe. Yeah, and I, I think they, uh, it brings to mind the old saying, you know, he who proves too much um, proves nothing. Um, their difficulty is that where they land is not a place anybody wants to be, and including themselves. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that there are two theories of the church, let's say, okay? There's, there's the one and, and of the magisterium, right? There's the one that that says that the church uh, is the infallibly safe teacher and guide of it uh, to eternal life, um, and that she nourishes that life through her doctrine, but also through the sacraments, and um, and she produces in men um, that spirit of prayer, uh, which which is again best expressed publicly and in common in the holy sacrifice so if you think about what the church is for it's to save men and what is salvation uh we're not lutherans salvation means changing you into something worthy of heaven and if all of the work's not done here it'll have to be completed in purgatory because you will be perfect when you get to heaven so you must change and that involves your will you have to you, your will has to be cured if you like that's the work of the church that's what the church is for now the, the, what these men are essentially proposing um 
And, and so because that's what the church is for, the traditional Catholic theology manuals describe this church was incapable of leading men astray. So you'll notice in that passage, it says she's not only incapable of teaching error uh, on, on faith or moral, she's also uh, incapable of even mandating a law, which would be immoral in some sense, right, or contradictory. So this is why the 83 Code so scandalized Archbishop Lefebvre. Uh, he said this is the end. Uh, in the letter he wrote about it, because it 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 authorised giving the Holy Communion to uh, giving Holy Communion to uh, the Holy Eucharist to to, to non Catholics. Uh, it was just just clearly an immoral act, uh, totally unjustifiable in any way whatsoever. And yet it was an official. This is you could not argue that this was not completely official and that it didn't bind the whole church. So. So that's that's what so that whole picture is of a piece. Now, what you do when you come up with your new theory to try and explain what's happened in the post-Vatican II era, and this is what they're doing, uh, they're coming up with a new theory because they've got new facts. But all of these so-called facts are predicated on the on the sort of central idea that these men must have been true popes. So therefore, the church is involved in all their acts, and therefore, well, the church is capable of things that the books used to say, always said, she couldn't be involved in. But why I say this lands them somewhere place they don't want to go is because you, you, you can't have that in isolation. It affects the very nature of the church and the very nature of the church's activity in the concrete day to day. So let's ask ourselves, are they willing to admit, and if they are, good on them, but I don't think they're Catholics, are they willing to admit that if you approach the Catholic Church, as they say, uh, randomly at any of her chapels, uh, you enter into instruction from the pastor there, who's been authorised, uh, using official materials sanctioned by by the bishops, uh, um, such as the you know the um, the various horrible catechetical materials that have been authorised over the years, that you are led to worship according to the Novus Ordo Musae, um, which Archbishop Lefebvre said we ha have to avoid uh, as as a species of false worship. You are taught. You know, to say your 20-decade rosary, uh, you are given your 15 stations of the cross. Not that, it, not that hardly anybody, you know, uses them. Um, you hardly ever go to confession and there's no pressure put on you and there's not much instruction given to, certainly in most parishes, to, to get you to confession at all. Uh, and that's why it doesn't happen, right? Um, it's because it's not emphasised, it's not pushed, it's not... It's not, and it's not theologically necessary in that system. Uh, sort of nothing's theologically necessary in that system. So, is the person who's subject to that system going to one retain the faith, two have their faith fostered and strengthened, uh, three are they going to have the virtue of hope uh, growing in their souls, and lastly, are they going to grow in charity so that their will is purified over the years and they become perfect? Is that a system for making men perfect? And the answer is, well, if you look at historically what happened after the council, the opposite happened. And in fact, not only did the opposite happen, that, that, that people became you know, less pious and less, less holy, as far as anybody could tell. But Louis, the holiest of people were affected most profoundly. They actually emptied... Consecra you know, convents full of consecrated virgins abandon their, their their habit and their life and their rule. So, so the the effect was actually strongest on the most delicate, if you like, or on the finest. Um, and and then it then it affected the laity to a lesser degree, but but certainly to a profound degree. And if you ask around amongst traditions, old traditions who were around, they didn't have theological reasons for rejecting all the changes. They just witnessed the manifest lack of holiness in the liturgy and in the practices of the church and in their fellow Catholics and went, this is horrible. And then they heard that the old mass was still, still being said somewhere and two and two make four, right? Oh, there's the old religion and then there's this new thing. 
So that's a bit long-winded, but uh, uh, that's my thinking anyway. I just think that if you if you argue that these things, that you can make enough legal distinctions between the degrees of magisterium, that somehow you think you get that you you get yourself off the hook, you're still faced with the fact that these are the official documents coming forward, and these are the things people take to be the teaching of the church. And Francis is certainly not saying anything to suggest that people ought not to believe it. And I believe that document, that, you know, Amoris Laetitia, was published in the Acta. Is that right? Uh, portions of it. The bishops of Buenos Aires came up with some guidelines for the application of Amoris Laetitia that allow for the people in uh, second and third marriages, so-called, to approach Holy Communion apart from obtaining any sort of an annulment or regularization of their present relationship. And... He had that placed in the Acta, along with his own commentary saying there are no other interpretations. So, I mean, well, a, I mean how much more clear tradition. could it be that this is yeah, a tradition. teaching act? One of the, one of the, one of the requirements for, for something to be uh, an infallible decree is that it, be, that it be imposed on the universal church. Okay. And the clearest... Uh, uh, not the only sign, not, this is not the only way that can happen, because the actor hasn't been around for the whole history of the papacy. It's, it's a relatively modern um, phenom- you know, institution. But if it's published in the actor, it's, it's, it's for the universal church. So you might have an address given to midwives or something by Pius XII. Um, and I, I know there are addresses of that nature. Whether they're in the actor or not would determine whether or not they are considered to be universal doctrine you know directed to the universal church so so if they if they would if it was an address given to the italian midwives association about some moral moral questions uh, you know affecting them to give them some instruction but it's not published in the acta you're entitled to say well that's got weight but it doesn't bind everybody but if it, once it's in the acta that's the holy father saying you know i i only gave that instruction to those people but but what i said has universal application and i want everybody to know about it right well, that's what that's what Francis uh, is. I mean, he already made it clear by publishing the document that it, at, you know there was no restriction on who it was published to, who it was addressed to. Um, mm-hmm. But by by putting that stuff from the from the bishops uh, of Argentina in uh, in the Arcta, you, that is stamping it with the authority of the Holy See. Right? And I'm not claiming that would make it an infallible document in itself, but it certainly meets one of the major criteria. The the issue. Um, I want to just come back to this issue of the of, of practically what's going on. So, so you've got a church which can mislead. You know, on this modern theory, you've got a church which can mislead people, can teach them error, um, which actually not only teaches them error but sees that they believe that error, and then is pacific in response to that. Right? Yeah. Sure. There's no issue with people believing error from you know what I mean. Like Francis. Did, you know, people talk about him like, like, less so him than JP2. You know, they'd say, oh, you know, I, I know if you read JP2, you know, carelessly, you might start believing in universal salvation, or you think he does. <laughs> uh, but but that's not what he really means. You know, that's just a, a little bit of emphasis here and there, you know. But <laughs> JP2 never never was concerned that everybody was starting to become syncretistic and, and believing in universal salvation. Um you know what I mean? There, I there was no concern it's, expressed. it's a good point. There's more than one way to teach error. One is to, to just simply tolerate it. You know, you think about you know our our role as as parents. If our children were totally wrapped up in some erroneous or false proposition, and we just allowed it to to go mm-hmm. on unfettered, well, clearly by our passivity, we'd be teaching the error. Exactly right. So, so, and and you know, um, it, that, that's the type of case where silence is consent. Um, right. So, um, so anyway, I'm just saying that that that, that theory uh, is so jerry rigged because it lands you where where you've got a church which practically carries men to hell, but can go, I'm innocent, I didn't do it officially. Right. <laughs> uh, you, you know what I mean? I didn't quite do it officially enough. What is that say? like? What's the purpose of infallibility? You know, is it a, is it an escape clause for bad popes? You, you know, uh, ah, I didn't use infallibility though, so you know it's all right. <laughs> but the whole church is going to hell in a handbasket. But 
you're off scot free. Is that what it's about? Is it about getting the Pope off the hook? That's insane, right? Uh, and that essentially is what it's all about. You know, it, it, and it's a way... It's become what it's about, right? It's kind of that, that slow yes. slide into absurdity where they've moved from the point of, look, when the Pope issues an official text of some sort, it's just fine to go through the text, find those things that resonate with Catholic tradition and embrace them, but find the things that are ambiguous or erroneous and jettison them. We don't have that yeah. right. But for those that are too lazy to even do that, whether intellectually lazy or physically lazy, or just not capable of doing such a thing, it's even easier which now. You can take people. an, part, which is most people. You which can, I think most people, right? True, which is, yeah. you know, why we treat the church like a holy mother and we behave as children. You don't need to be a theologian to be a good, faithful Catholic. But now it's even easier in this new scenario. It's you can take an entire text of 60,000 words and just file it away in a file cabinet because it's not magisterium after all. It's not really teaching. It's essentially uh, tantamount to an op-ed to your local newspaper. So you don't even have to worry about ferreting through the text to find the nuggets of truth. You can just that's put the whole thing point. in a drawer. You know, no, that's a great point, Louis, because because the theory, the theory being proposed, because uh, what they're trying to do is fit a square peg in a round hole, right? So, so on the one hand, you've got what's in the books and how, and, and what's in the books is how the church was behaved. Right? And in fact, the practice of the church is the source of a lot of that doctrine. And, and in the Summa, you know, you, re, you read the Summa of St. Thomas, and, and, and uh, one of the common proofs he gives, um, you know, uh, he will say um, um, to the contrary, the church does otherwise. Boom. So a modern St. Thomas, uh, on the pre, you know, predicating his position on, on the Novus Ordo sect being the church would 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 be entitled to say uh you say the nova Ordo is no good but the church does otherwise she uses this mass universally in the west mm. Bomp. end of argument right gotcha so so okay what's in the books is is how the church is and how she can behave right based on how she always has behaved uh and the promises of our lord the positive sources etc um, and then they take, and then on the other hand, you've got these facts, like how these men have behaved in the post-Vatican II, or, you know, John the Twenty-Third onwards, and it's radically different. And they're they're trying to 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 make these facts sort of fit in the matrix of the pre-Vatican II doctrine, and it's really square peg round hole stuff because because um, you've got in the pre-Vatican II manuals a discussion of the. Uh, the fact that the, the Holy Father doesn't have to always and doesn't always use the fullness of his teaching power in every act of teaching. And so then you, you get this notion that, well, a magisterial act isn't necessarily an infallible act. He, he might be teaching, so it's, and he's teaching authoritatively. You're bound by it, but you, you don't have that same assurance of certitude that you would get if it was an infallible decree. And they go, ah, we see a loophole. Uh, if we can, if, you know, uh, th these men, John the 23rd onwards, um, they didn't talk like popes who were teaching infallibly. They spoke like journalists making commentary. So it's not authoritative. It's not binding. Right? And if it's not being imposed, it can't be infallible. Ah, that's our loophole. Well, you know, it's not much of a loophole because the... Um, as I say, where that leads you is the fact that, that as long as the Pope avoids sort of touching the third rail, which is infallibility, that, that's the Pope killer, right? <laughs> it, it, you know what I mean? It's, it, as, long as, he, as long as he just stays away from that, that, uh, the nuclear button, okay, he can destroy the entire church, teach everybody heresy, impose a, a bad liturgy, <laughs> make bad laws, uh, basically lead souls to hell, and there's no problem. Not no problem. They, that's, that's unfair to the argument. They say, oh, there's big problems. They say, well, our Lord didn't promise that that wouldn't be able to be done. And I'm here to say, I'm sorry, I don't believe in that church. Okay? Right. I do not believe in that. Can't believe in that church. I can't believe. And why? Because 
I don't have to. It's not part of the Catholic faith to believe in a defective church that, that actively leads people to hell while going, Bali's, you know, I'm off the hook. I didn't do it infallibly. Right, exactly. But, so, John, in this scenario where, you know, if it doesn't have the stamp of infallibility, the the Pope who taught it's off the hook, the faithful are off the hook for any degree of adherence to whatever error the guy put out. Uh, but this brings to mind some of the things that the theologians have had to say about what is required of the Catholic in light of non-infallible teachings that come from the Holy Father. And uh, one in particular is fresh in my memory. I've been discussing this with some folks in the past week. It comes from Monsignor Joseph Fenton, and he's certainly not the only person saying it, but he talked about the Catholics, uh, re Catholics being required to give a firm mental assent to those teachings, mm -hmm. albeit conditional. And I, I, I want to get your uh, thoughts on what does this mean for it to be conditional for mental assent? In my mind, the condition has to do with the idea that it's conditional upon uh, the idea that the church may in time infallibly define the topic being addressed in such way as to have us kind of reform our thoughts on the particular topic. But what it does not mean is that it's conditional upon whatever is being taught being true. Because in no scenario are we called to give any sort of assent to a non-infallible teaching that's at odds with those things that have always been taught. So can you talk about that in short? What is the Catholic individual's duty toward non-infallible teachings? That come from the Pope. Oh, it's exactly, sure, it's exactly what Fenton says. Okay, so so we know there's a problem because we can't behave that way in the post-Vatican II era. Um, we can't give a firm mental assent to to Vatican II, for example. Um, the documents are, are not; it's not possible to do that and retain the Catholic faith. Um, so, so there's a problem now. Again, this this sort of loophole uh, type argument, this sort of legalistic, pharisaical argument, uh, is brought forth that that well, you know, that consent isn't the same as consent to an infallible decree, um, and you know, therefore, it's in some sense conditional. Um, I, I don't really like the word conditional, actually, but that's all right. Um, it's because it's not a provisional consent it's an actual consent here and now yeah it's not it's not i consent to this if it's true but um it's 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 the intellect recognizing it as true on the authority of the church so this is why i think this can't really be understood without franzlin's doctrine of 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 uh, infallible safety um because certainly it's true that, that, that if there's not infallibility of truth, there, there's the possibility of error, no matter how remote. The question is, what's the character of the error that might be present? Now, it, you know, go through any encyclical. Um, the encyclical declaring Bellman, you know, doctor of the universal church, um, you know, encyclical on St. Anselm or, you know, uh, an encyclical on the Blessed Virgin Mary that might mention um, historical facts that uh, are not necessarily um, given in the same exact words as they're given in Holy Scripture. There's the possibility that um, you know a, a wrong date might be there, or, or uh, the impressions given that you know um, that. Our Lady visited Bethlehem twice, or something. You know what I mean? Just something that's. And afterwards, people look at it and they go, oh, "Hang on, hang on, hang on." The way that's, the way that's, <laughs> the way that's worded, you might think this. You know, so that might be corrected by a later, uh, a later document, and then you know, and we see that type of thing in the history of the Church, um, and, and you, you get the sense that, in some sense, but again, all within the realm of safety. Uh, something's being explained away, perhaps, <laughs> almost, right? So that's that that possibility um, I would place within those limits. Well, you know, Franzlin and Bio and, and, and Van Norden and, and Fenton um, place that possibility of error within that, those limits. That is the limit of safety. Uh, so, so that's totally different to what we're dealing with now. 
Um, is that, yeah? It and is then, clear. And John, one of the things, so this is a question that I, I've been uh, researching and delving into, and that's the question of what is my duty as yeah. a faithful Catholic toward those things that come to me from the Pope? And in reading uh, the commentary of theologians, a couple of phrases keep popping up. One is per accidents. In other words, if, if some by mistake, and then it's all very often followed up by in very rare occasions. And I think that's the sort of thing you're talking about. That's something that is conveyed as a matter of fact that might by some accident or mistake be erroneous, but we're not talking about a false teaching in matters of faith and morals correct yeah correct and and this is uh it's connected um with with a sort of philosophical error an epistemological error of the of modern man where he he sort of in a way it's a variation on the error of the beard it, it, it's where uh if you can have so for instance think about something like um salvation in the church there's no salvation outside the church not any so, though, but there is the possibility that those who aren't actual members might be saved, so might be brought within the church when they die, you know, prior to death. So they're found within the church at death. They could be saved. That's obviously an exceptional situation. It's exceptional because the church is the ark of salvation and she has the means. And if you're not a member, you don't get access to those means. Right. Right. So, so, uh, so if it's unless it's so, so the so that possibility must be a remote and, and unusual in the concrete order, it must be remote and unusual, you know, that, that someone finds themselves or manages to be within the church but not a member when they die, right? And in the state of grace, in other words, <laughs> amazing With, without access to sacraments of penance and the Holy Eucharist. And, if that's not an unusual and exceptional situation, uh, if you posit that in the concrete order, actually the vast majority of mankind are saved, for example, but I'm orthodox, I'm saying they're all within the church when they die. I'm not saying they're members, but I'm saying that... Then what you've really said is the means of salvation aren't necessary, they're auxiliary. <laughs> So it's taking the exception and making it the rule. And, and I think it's the way, the reason I say it's a variation on the era of the beard, it's, be, it's because they can't keep, people can't keep um, in view that, uh, that just because there's a sort of a continuum doesn't mean it's there, there, there are not two ends. Um, so, you know, the thing at this end is not the thing at this end. <laughs> um, so an exceptional case is an exceptional case. Right. So think about that in the context of doctrinal teaching, uh, the possibility of some error in, 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 in non-infallible teaching uh, does not suggest for one moment that there can be rampant error in, in magisterial teaching because, and this is what I was saying before in different words, because then you're really saying is this is not a trustworthy teacher. The church is not a trustworthy teacher. And that proposition is just heretical. <laughs> it's just like plain, straight out heterodox. And, there, and therefore, there is, is absolutely no infallible security. It, it's gone once you cross over that line to thinking that the church might hand me something that's false in matters of faith and morals, albeit in a non-infallible text. There's no infallible yeah, security in that relationship, correct? There isn't, and, 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 and as you say, you, you're no longer in the, in the presence of a good mother who gives her children all that she needs, um, this divinely instituted... <laughs> it's blasphemous, really, uh, in its implications, because it's saying that our Lord Jesus Christ, um, his, his promises were either temporary or, or, or they were deceptive. He, he sounded like he was saying, I'm going to take you into my bosom, I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost, and we're going to dwell within you. And I'm securely going, to, and, and don't be sad because I'm going to give you this comforter, right? So who will, right? Who will carry you to heaven? And that that security, uh, which is the virtue of hope, it's a, it's a species of certitude, hope, right? Um, it, 
don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not wanting to suggest um, presumption. I, I really am talking about hope. Um, that 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 is a species of, of certitude, and and uh, hope should fill our fill our souls. <laughs> and and the more we pray and and make some sort of progress, however halting in the in the spiritual life, we we should grow in hope, right? So that promise makes no sense in the Vatican II era. Uh, you know you. <laughs> You can't rely on these people are openly saying you can't rely on these means of salvation. You can't rely on the on the on the magisterium instituted by Lord Jesus Christ to lead you into all truth. You just can't rely on it. Well, they've reinterpreted that promise of the Paraclete leading the church into all truth to opening the way for the God of surprises to show up, and not leading you more deeply into the one truth, but leading mm-hmm. you into other <laughs> truths <laughs> that are actually falsehoods. <laughs> new, so, new, new, wonderful discoveries. Right. Liberating truths, you know, where there is no divine law. But so, John, you've kind of queued up without knowing it, a question that's right in front of me from one of our viewers. And his question is, at what point does error on the part of a pope, in particular, he's speaking here, at what point does error become heresy? Where's the line? Before you get to that, though, he he cues this question up himself with a, a an assumption saying that we know popes can make errors. Now, when I read that, my thought is, well, of course they can in their daily lives, but I don't see a whole lot of wiggle room for a pope making erroneous and false teachings with regard to faith and morals in official instruments, such as an apostolic exhortation, an encyclical letter, and so forth. They may, and let me ask you this, am I correct that per accidens, that Latin phrase essentially means by mistake, is that true? Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe factual data, but we're not talking about errors in matters of faith and morals. The popes cannot uh, really make those errors in official text that they issue, regardless of how loud the other side screams. It's not actually a teaching act to issue an apostolic exhortation to every bishop in the universal church. No, but, you know, I, I don't want to... Uh, I think it's a mistake to... And, I mean, we are accused constantly by our opponents. Uh, traditionalists generally are accused um, of um, of exaggerating, you know, uh, the papacy, exaggerating the infallibility of the Pope and ex- expecting too much of the Pope. Well, <laughs> I think we'd all like to expect something from the Pope. <laughs> this would be the, the current answer. Uh, but it really is, there is an error there. Um they are they're wrong in in saying we exaggerate um, the infallibility of the Pope. I think we're quite. I mean, I'm, in my case, and I, I know this is the case of, of all the all the educated traditionalists I know. We we just grab the books. I mean, you know, some of these ones behind me. <laughs> we see what they say and try and understand them as best we can. We're not looking to inflate the infallibility of the Pope at all. And and that would be an error to do that, right? To to try and make infallibility cover everything. Um. So, what I don't want to do is I, I don't want to base our position on on the notion that there could be no theological error in any act of the magisterium, any individual act of the magisterium. Not not because I think there can be particularly, but I'm thinking of a situation. For example, say um, say in a text you had something like um, you know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the greatest of God's creatures. Now that's ambiguous because. If you mean the greatest of uh, of beings that are creatures, the answer is yes. But if you mean the greatest of created things, then no, the sacred humanity of Christ stands higher. Now, that's not going, you would think, to mislead anybody. But if you can imagine a papal text in which that type of emphasis with insufficient qualification, for say, because in that context, that's not dangerous, right? But... But imagine, and I can't think of an example, but, but you could easily see that there might be something that's said like that, where there's an emphasis and then there's a, 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 a qualification you'd like to have there to, to preclude error isn't there. And then you find that some people actually are led into error by it. And then there's a subsequent document issued at some point, might be another pope later, you know, to, to and he wouldn't say that was wrong. <laughs> It just wouldn't do that because it wouldn't want to damage the authority of the church, right? 
But so that type of thing's imaginable, and this is what the theologians, as far as I can understand them, have in mind when they talk about the possibility of a future clarification or uh, you know um, a modification in some sense. Okay. So having said that, look at the history of the church and find those examples where there really was error and it really was given out in some sense by a pope and then look at the reaction of the church. If you look at um, the very early ones, Liberius, um, for example, is a bad example because the historical facts are disputed. So you, but Bellarmine, who accepts that Liberius must have fallen in some sense, uh, also holds that, well, he lost the papacy and Felix was elected in his place, Felix II. Um, so that's one example. A, a second example, which I've raised with you, I don't know if I've raised it in these sessions or just offline, but um, is Paschal II. You know, Paschal II signed an agreement with the Holy Roman Emperor, which implied... Uh, some heresy, and that is that the the, the Holy Roman Emperor had uh, had the true right of appointing bishops, and he didn't. Um, he couldn't. He couldn't appoint bishops. Um, all he, even if he thought he was appointing bishops, uh, the Pope would be actually appointing the bishops, and and the Holy Roman Emperor would be advising the Pope. Um, but don't tell him that's what he's doing. <laughs> you might have a situation like that in a concordat, but in this concordat. Um, Several saints, several canonized, subsequently canonized saints, including Saint Bruno, Bruno the famous Saint Bruno, um, uh, told him, "You have to withdraw your signature. That's heretical." And Saint Guido of, of Vienne uh, said to him, "If you don't withdraw your signature from that document, uh, you will be separating yourself from communion with us. In other words, you won't be pope." And Pascal did withdraw his signature, and then and he said to someone else in a letter, uh, "If I if I hadn't done that, Bruno would have taken the papacy away from me by his preaching." So that's what happens when you get an actual theological error in in coming from a pope. Now this is you know this is not a de fide. Um, <laughs> This is not an ex cathedra decision by the Roman pontiff. No one would think it was. Otherwise, papal infallibility is, you know, not true. But it is a pope acting officially um, and putting his name to something. So, you know, there it is. Um, the point is that that the more you go and John the twenty second, I mean that that case is uh, is. Um, is a real mess the way it's discussed because actually the, the main reason that he was under pressure uh, for his error was because he had enemies and those enemies were heretics and the heretics were the ones who were accusing him most strongly. Um, but leaving aside that, the fact is that, that, that an error on something that wasn't opposed to define doctrine um, and was at that point a somewhat free question in theology, even that error produced this reaction um, and he instituted a commission of cardinals to examine the doctrinal question and when they came back and said no you're wrong here's the here's the correct doctrine he um, <coughs> said that's what he accepted right so you can't find a case in history where people have to habitually ignore the pope or correct the pope or you know um, sift through the, through the pope's writing it's, it's just there's nothing like that which strongly, it's, a, it's an a priori, very strong case that that situation is not possible. But that is what we're faced with on the hypothesis that John the Twenty Third through ha have been have been popes, right? That's it's it's clearly necessary in practice to do that <laughs> if they're popes, because you can't just sit on the sit at their knee and and believe them. You, you can't do that. It's not safe. Right. And these things, these comparisons seem to be totally different in kind. I mean, you have Pascal putting his signature to. A document giving a permission to one particular emperor. You have John the Twenty Second delivering sermons that have yes. an erroneous proposition set forth on a matter that was still being debated among theologians yes. anyway. And then you could go yes. to a case like Honorius, who sent a private letter to Sergius saying something debatable, and scholars yeah. still disagree about what he meant. In no way does mm -hmm. that compare to an apostolic exhortation telling all the bishops and faithful of the world. 
that sometimes God wills that we commit adultery. I mean, these things are totally different in kind. We're not talking about... Well, they are. It's not yeah, even apples are. and oranges. It, it's like apples and rocks. I mean, they're totally different. Yeah. But in principle, the question is, is it possible for there to be a situation in which, um, you know, because people talk about when they bring forth proofs for their position, and I'm talking about this uh, sede plainus traditionalist that we say, you know, um, they, they cite things like Bellaman. You know, you raised Bellaman a couple of weeks ago and, uh, you know, resisting the Pope. Um, St. Saint, Saint Paul resisting St. Peter um, or, you know, um, well, yeah, but that's a, a single instant, right? That's, that's one incident. <laughs> it is one doctrinal problem if it's doctrinal, and and it's got to be resolved. There's right. no backing down, right? It's got to be resolved because the alternative is you're gone, right? You're separating yourself from communion with us in Pascal's case, right? Now, we've got that being cited as though, as though this is authorizing lay people to ignore the hierarchy or, or to treat the hierarchy as as a, an advice bureau or something you know? and, as you say they're not similar at all um so yeah but that's you know what else do you get when there's just total confusion um and and the fault isn't the traditionalists you know or even the people in the nova Sordo. the faults with the uh the modernists right and I, I think you make such a good point you know when you look at these historical cases that supposedly excuse the Pope for continuously making mm. errors in matters of faith and morals. How did yeah. the church react? The church reacted vehemently and quickly, you yeah. know, and strenuously. So that that's even further evidence that this institution in Rome today that identifies itself as the Holy Roman Catholic Church is nothing but an imposter. It's reaction to these sorts of blatant, terrible heresies, uh, horrible, grave errors with respect to faith and morals is... To simply shrug it off as well. He wasn't really teaching after all. <laughs> it's, these are to, two totally different institutions. The Holy Catholic Church reacts violently towards grave errors of that nature. The, the, yeah, yeah, the conciliar church is just another day in the park. You know, it's no, not that big of a deal. But just, so, John, Louis, if, if go ahead, yeah, go on. No, no, please. I, I was just going to say, if you had a parallel situation within the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth, right amongst the clergy that that you know we rely on. Um, say, um, you know, Bishop TCA came out with some heresy. It, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't be tolerated, right? Because even the lay people wouldn't tolerate it. They'd be going, no, 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 this has got to be resolved. No, 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 we, we need, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. You just, it would just not be, it would just not be, you couldn't move on from it until it had been satisfactorily resolved. Now you say, well, you know, in the church after Vatican II, how do you satisfactorily resolve anything? Well, that's another proof that this is a different church because because all appeals to Rome, you know, there were many letters, probably tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of letters sent to Rome in the late, you know, through the 60s into the 70s and then, you know, probably petered out in the 80s. Appeals, appeals by priests saying, do I have to say this new mass? My bishop's saying, making me do it. I think I've got the right, under quote, premium to say the old mass. Appeals from religious institutes are being required to change their, their habit and their their rule, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Appeals from lay people are being persecuted for being faithful Catholics, right? The vast majority of those, nearly all of them, were 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 answered with either go see your bishop, the guy who's persecuting you, or literally ignored, literally ignored, no answer at all. That's not a caring, loving church. Right? It's not the Catholic Church. It's certainly not. It's just it, awful. It's something. It's, but... so it's so awful. But people aren't aware of this, you know. Like, people today aren't aware that this all happened, you know. It's, just, it's, it's sad because if they had all the facts, they'd be just going, well, that's awful, you know. I like, anyway. that, I like that phrase you use, treating the conciliar church like an advice bureau. I might have to steal that and use it in a future art article. I like it. Because that truly is essentially how conservative Catholics and many traditionalist Catholics treat the church in Rome what is if what's coming out of there it's really just advice that, that the kind of thing you might yeah, get but, from a wise neighbor or not so wise neighbor and you're just free to ignore it or 
or, or not. It's that's all it is. Yeah, just some different. advice. But it's different from it's different from um, from um, I don't know. So, say say you've got uh, say you've got uh, an interest in fly fishing, right? Uh, and there's and there's a YouTube channel with a guy who knows all about fly fishing, and he puts up a show every week, right? And and you realise no, this guy knows, you know. And we all have examples of that, you know. Um, the reason you think, ah, I'll check with him, is because he's got credibility. You know that he's generally reliable. You know that he's an expert, and he says he's generally reliable. Right? <laughs> okay, so you check in with him. Well, nobody checks in with the Nova Soto bishops because they think they're expert and they know their stuff and they generally are right you only check in because you read in the catechism that you must believe what the church teaches and that's the bishops and the pope so you're actually literally doing it legalistically you're right. going through the motions it's true isn't it no yeah, one, yeah, no one really thinks the bishop's the expert right and i genuinely don't know one single solitary soul that consults the teachings of Francis in order to come to some understanding of the faith as though he's got any expertise whatsoever. None. I, I don't even, I don't even know a Nova sort of priest who does that. Yet I do know many who don't even listen to him because they don't want to torture themselves by listening to the guy. In any case, so John, the second, the, the question part of this particular viewer's uh, query to us is at what point does error become heresy? I think we've touched on this a bit in some previous uh, issues, but is, is there kind of a, a a brief to the point answer to that kind of a question? At what point does error become heresy? Well, the simple answer is when when the doctrine that's 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 being doubted or denied uh, is something that must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. Right, that's the technical answer. Um, right. It's objectively, then it's heresy. Um, but, uh, so, so that implies that in order to uh, identify heresy, you, you have to know what it is that you must believe with divine and Catholic faith. Um, and a lot of people don't, <laughs> not very clearly anyway, you know? Um, so, um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure what he's really asking. There's no, there are no simple, some things are very simple, you know, but, but there's nothing easy, uh, about about living in this era we're in, you you, you have to do if you want to if you want to get a if you want to get a grip on these things and and, and be able to have uh, clear thoughts um, and some answers, you got to do some work. Absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah it it kind of takes it, us back to your first comments and the the uh, excerpt that you read from that book. The idea of the church being so eclipsed to the point where. In the case of the sun being eclipsed and darkness falls, you got to work to find your way under those circumstances. You can. The sun's still there, albeit blocked and eclipsed to an yeah. extent. But you're right. We live in a difficult age where it really does take rolling up your sleeves and going to work to try to discern. It, it does. And also, and, and, and also remembering, and this is why I keep coming back to this idea, just, just imagine when it's all over how it will look, right? And then it'll just be an historical case to be solved, if you like. Uh it's good to try and understand. That's what your that's what your mind's for. It's very bad if that damages your faith. If that endeavour results in in your faith being damaged, right. it's very easy for that to happen, right? Certainly, People get caught up and 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 they sort of imagine that if they don't settle this question, um, they can't believe anymore. Almost, yeah. Um, they have. But that's not true. That's not true at all. Right. Yeah, That's yeah. And, I, and I know people who've gone down that path and have moved over to Eastern Orthodoxy because they just couldn't get their head around what's going on with this man claiming to be Pope. So they've, mm. they, they've left the farm for that reason. So now let's that's... jump into an, another question here. <clears throat> what does the the teachings of the First Vatican Council the only authentic Vatican Council. It, it teaches that in Peter, we will always have, quote unquote, perpetual successors. And our mm. viewer wants to know, what does that mean to you from this set of a contest position that you hold? Oh, well, it means what it means in the books. Um, perpetual successors uh, does not mean that there will be no gaps 
because every time the Pope dies, there's a gap. Um, and it doesn't mean there can't be a gap longer than one year or three years because they've been in terrain before in the history of the church that are that long. But in any case, the, the theologians don't say that. Um, so what it means is that there will always be uh, the papacy and the until the end of time. I mean, the, the Sea of Rome may be vacant when our Lord comes again. That's that's theori- that's theoretically possible. There's nothing heterodox in that idea. Right? So so the Pope is killed by Antichrist, say, and then our Lord comes and destroys Antichrist with the brightness of His coming, as it says in the Apocalypse. And and then the, and then well, when our Lord comes, that's the end of the world. Right? Any other any other idea is heretical. So. Um, so it's technically possible for the for the papacy to actually be vacant when our Lord returns, uh, the second coming. So, so let's leave aside that um, and then just think. Well, um, uh, what is what is what is possible, and what is certainly possible is what what I think we're seeing, which is a very long for vacancy to be followed by um, by a true pope. So perpetual successes um, means that. Each of the popes will be a true successor of St. Peter. They'll have the same the same powers and prerogatives um, and the same responsibility, etc., uh, that that he had, which can be passed on. Because some of his um, uh, some of his uh, privileges were were for him alone, and some were to be passed on to 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 the, to the you know with the sea, if you like. Uh, so that's 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 what that means, and and uh, and I don't, I just it's just a non-issue for set of Acanists, and I don't think anybody presses that very hard against us because they know really that they, it's not a very good argument. <laughs> um, I think they know that but people people who make that kind of argument are the sort of people who say, well, you know, um, you have to go to the Novus Ordo because you know, that's the that's the mass that the church wants you to go to. That's what they, you know what I mean? That's right. Just, where, they, where do you go? You can't go anywhere with those people. Right. Well, and then the question is, what you know, how long of a set of a Conte period is tolerable before? I mean, there are no definitions. I, I think the the longest was three and a half years, if I'm not mistaken. But have have the theologians or do the manuals even remotely begin to address the idea of how long? can the church tolerate a set of a Conte period and still be the church? You know, I don't think that's addressed, is it? Is that... It's not. Uh, the only text that we've found, and, and, you know, we welcome endeavors by our opponents to open the books and find texts, but they don't seem to find any. We seem to find them all, which suggests to me that we're the ones doing the reading. <laughs> um, but um, John Daly, many years ago, back in, I think maybe even in the 80s, but certainly uh, at the latest in the 90s, um, found a text that's that's published you know, widely now um, from a, a, an Irish theologian called uh, O'Reilly uh, on the long-term vacancy of the Holy See. And he flatly says, you know, uh, don't put limits to what God will allow um, that are outside of theology. So, you know, the limits that God places on himself, uh, he reveals to us. Um if he hasn't revealed some limit, it's not, you know, don't assume it's there. Sure. Uh, God may put a, a terrible situation. Ray, you yeah. talk about just, you know, just how much the Lord will allow. I mean, if you spoke to a faithful Catholic in 1955 and described what we're living through, that, that person would have a whole lot of difficulty believing that an ecumenical council is going to be called that taught the yeah. nonsense that were, was taught at Vatican II. The sacred liturgy will be turned upside down. It, it, you would hardly be able to fault a Catholic in 1955 who would say to you, no, that's not possible. The Lord would never allow that to happen. Well, guess what? It's, it's interesting, though, Louis, because that's one of the points that I think Manning makes in, in his book, uh, The Holy See Tested by Prophecy, I think it's called, um, which has been republished in recent years because it's, it's, uh, it's quite prophetic. You know? And he, uh, I think it's Manning, that makes the point that um, that uh you know don't think the church you know we we, we sort of I, I think he's he's alluding to the fact that catholics got infected by this progressivist historical progressivism that you know things are always getting better because the industrial mm. revolution had resulted in this rise of living standards and you know more material prosperity and 
and, and you know, new technology was always coming along. And life was just getting better and better in every way, you know, and the church will just keep getting better now, you know. It's, uh, it's nonsense. And, and he's saying, you know, that this isn't God's plan. We know the church is going to undergo a terrible trial sometime in the future. Right. Yeah, so, you know, but going back to this book here, um, the the divine plan of the church, um, he... Uh, he says, um, he says that through the opposition of anti-popes and a variety of untoward circumstances, it was difficult, circumstances would make it difficult for individuals for the moment to tell where the right source of authoritative teaching was to be found. And that's the problem, right? It's the problem you keep... You've raised that question how many times in these in these talks? Yeah, it's a, it's a central question for every Catholic life today. Well, it's prophesied that that will come about. <laughs> right, and we're living a, through it. In an ordinary little English, you know, um, apologetics work from, from 1901. It's not like it's... So I'm just saying uh, I, we feel like this is an intensely... Um, you know, confusing and, and confronting situation, and, and it is and viewed in one way, but viewed in the light of faith and with the aid of, of, of well, knowledge like, you know, as is in that book. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it was to be expected. <laughs> it was Certainly. And, and even though that book doesn't use the phrase counterfeit church or imposter or, uh, you know, this institu the institution that's going to ape the Catholic Church, which is what Fulton yeah. Sheen said before he lost his mind to the council. Um, if Catholics are struggling to find the source of authority, that implies that there is something there that is posing as a source of authority that isn't. Otherwise, the source of authority would be perfectly plain. Yeah. So, I mean, this idea that there's going to be a counterfeit church, and, you know, we've heard about it prophesied. Well, folks, it's got to be here. It's here. It's here, is it? Isn't it? Oh, I think it is. I think it's obviously I, I, You know, there's famous quotes from Father Berry, uh, which actually my wife was the one who found those. She was reading Father Berry's um, The Church of Christ, and she, she called, John, come and see this, you know. Um you know, uh, Antichrist will set up a false church with imitations of the, the mass and the sacraments. And, uh, I mean, it's just a, there you go. It's prophesied. It's, it's, it's more than, yeah, it's prophesied. And so we have types of Antichrist throughout salvation history. And so, I mean, just to tack on to that point, Antichrist will set up this counterfeit church. But that's not to say that there won't be a counterfeit church of some sort, even prior to the Antichrist yep. coming on the scene. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. John, our next yeah. question is uh, a viewer wants to hear your thoughts on Humanae Vitae and your views on it from your perspective. And I think that's one that probably deserves a little bit more attention than we have time. So I'm going to shut it off here with the promise that we'll pick it up on that question next time we get together next week. How's that sound? Well, that's just... That's just mean. <laughs> oh, I know. You dangle the carrot. You know, we got to get the people back. So we'll see. All right. Okay. But John had a great time chatting with you today. Any closing thoughts you'd like to offer before we sign off? Yeah. Well, one thought that occurred to me that I didn't, I didn't express is, uh, you know, you know, Chris Ferrara, um, uh, wrote a book, uh, years ago now, maybe 10 years ago called the great facade. Mm -hmm. And, and the thesis is that all this stuff's not really authoritatively imposed, it's all just sort of put out there and people are deceived into adopting the new religion for the church. So it's his way of explaining the church isn't really responsible. Yeah. And, and what I think is if, if that's true, and I, there's a lot of truth in that, right? They did behave differently from, from how the church behaves and how true authorities behave. Um, if that's true, that's not the church because the church doesn't do that. Exactly. Yeah, so facade's a, a, a great word, but I mean, it's, you know, one small step to saying that whole institution just is not the Catholic Church. Yeah. Demonstrably so. Yeah. All right. Good Thanks chatting you. with you, John. As always, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.